We want to thank Colorado Business Roundtable for partnering with us on this wonderful event. Um, and again, just this very important topic in terms of cybersecurity of the future, what every organizational leader needs to know. Um, I also want to give a special thank you to Denver Business Journal for their media sponsorship of this event. Um, you know, they're obviously a, a forerunner in helping leaders get together like this. So we, we look forward to um, continuing working with them. Uh, in addition to working on critical policy issues that impact companies across all sectors of, of Colorado, you know, we're excited with Cobert to bring quality, relevant educational programs like this to business leaders. So it's excited to have you here. Um, we, we're going to start this morning with a um, quick few remarks and introduction of our keynote from Franny Matthews. Franny is currently the CEO of Colorado Technical Association. Prior to joining CTA, Franny spent 18 years with IBM and served as the IBM Senior Location Executive for Denver. As a private sector healthcare and life science sales leader in the Western region, she is responsible for growing the IBM profile within the territory. She has over 10 years of sales management and leadership experience with regional uh, high performance teams. Industry verticals have included higher education, state and local, healthcare, and telecommunications. Franny has been a member of the University of Colorado Wellness Center board and served as a board member of the Colorado Technical Association for two years before her current role. And then she has been an active member uh, of the, sorry, flip the switch, Colorado Business Roundtable's inner circle and Governor Hickenlooper has recently appointed her to the Colorado Wo Workforce Development Council. Please join me in welcoming Franny. shorten my bio I sound really old um, I am old um, so thank you Andy I appreciate the introduction and uh, I am so happy to be here this morning um, we have a great set of panelists and this is going to be a wonderful discussion and a very important discussion um, about the current landscape of cybersecurity and the future and um, how to prepare your respective workforces um, to handle what's coming. Um, the Colorado Technology Association provides leaders, innovators, and entrepreneurs with the answers and resources they need. We work to create an environment where tech thrives in Colorado, and I am passionate about this for two reasons. First, every business is going through digital transformation, and it is critically important um, that they have a handle on that underpinning and in order for our economy to thrive, we must have a, a vibrant tech economy. And that's really what brought me to Colorado Technology Association, both as a board member and now as the CEO. When um, CSU Global and the Colorado Business Roundtable reached out to us to be a part of this, we jumped at the opportunity. The issues around cybersecurity are pervasive, and it is, in fact, the, the foundation for everything we do as we transform digitally. Um, and it is important that we address these issues and we have a strategic and agile plan because as this room knows, it changes every day. So it is my pleasure to introduce this morning the keynote for today, Chris Bradbury, Senior Manager uh, in cyber risk services at Deloitte. With over 14 years of experience in cyber risk, uh, cyber risk, <laughs> uh, Chris uh, is a Deloitte advisory principal and a leader in Deloitte's data risk practice. He um, focuses on advising large and complex organizations as they undertake cybersecurity, privacy, and data protection initiatives. In particular, Chris has extensive experience in identifying requirements and developing protection strategies for private, confidential, and sensitive data throughout its life cycle. He has deep knowledge in data classification, rights management technology, and associated business process strategies. So please help me welcome Chris to the stage. Careful, that's a 
First step's a doozy. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Franny, and thanks, Andy, and thanks, everybody, for having me here today. I really appreciate the time and an honor to be able to be here to speak with you today. Um, I'd like to share a few remarks in, in advance of the panel and, and uh, the gentleman who we've assembled here today to speak with you uh, around cybersecurity and why it's such an important business and initiative and imperative today. Um, you know, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, organizations are, are focusing more resources, money, people, effort on cybersecurity, yet the problem continues to, to pervade. And I, I was looking at uh, the Gartner uh, estimates around global cybersecurity spending, and last year it was 89 billion. This year they're estimating it to be 96 billion. And yet you continue to see in the market or in the, in the papers every day headlines around uh, a new breach, uh, a new vulnerability, um, a new, a new uh, attack. And so things are, are not changing. The, the pace is quickening and, and the threat landscape is growing. And so we all as, as business leaders need to be uh, cognizant of that and have the ability to really uh, drive this as a, as a priority within our organizations. The, the key underpinning of why this is such an issue for me is, is that the platforms that we use to communicate and collaborate and do business in general are, are, for the vast majority and for the most part, built for sharing and not built to be secure. So if you look at uh, a protocol like email, uh, something we use, every, each one of us I'm sure uses every day, it's a decades old now protocol. Uh, it was built a long time ago for a very different purpose, to send short messages, quickly, efficiently, uh, and without any friction. And if you look at the, the landscape of what's, how people are trying to secure email today, there's a number of different systems and different, different techniques, but they're, they all tend to have one big issue in my mind, and that's that they, are, they inter introduce friction and they introduce uh, a level of user uh, inability to use, and the user experience is just not good. And so that's one example I could go on with, with you know, the, the newer technologies like cloud services and, and, uh, and document fi and file sharing services. They all were built really to, to share and to be efficient and not at their core to be secure. And so that's kind of the, the uphill battle that we're all facing. So I mentioned a, a bit earlier, what, cybersecurity, 10, 15, 20 years ago was, was absolutely a technology issue. Um, it was something that uh, was bits and bytes, people were focused only on the technology. And, and the organizations that are successful today in, in combating the, the threats and combating the attacks are really ones that look at it as a business risk issue. And they look at what are the, what are the pieces of, of information that I have that are an asset that I need to protect, but still be need, need to be able to use and share and, and be efficient with? And what are, the, what are the data assets that I have, data, data elements that I have that are really purely a liability? And how do I lock those down or, or even just get rid of them? And this becomes even more important when you talk about the extended enterprise and the, the amount of data that has been host, being hosted in the cloud and and uh, the, the amount of data that is being shared with third parties uh, within each and every one of our organizations. It's, it's no longer the fact that you, or the case that you can build a perimeter, guard your castle, and uh, be able to, to defend that castle. It is now a village, and it is now a, a, a region that you have to be able to understand where things are moving and how they're moving and, and who, who is getting that information and how they're protecting it. And so if you look at this, this issue as a business issue as opposed to a technology issue, you get much more pointed on where you're able to focus your, those assets and those, those energies and those dollars and people. Uh, and that's kind of the first step that, we're, that any successful organization goes down. Uh, if I look back at the, at the history of, of cybersecurity and, and cyber risk over the past uh, 20 years or so, 15, 20 years, you know, it started, um, and obviously 2005 isn't the, the beginning of cybersecurity, but it was really the era of compliance, where you had things like PCI and Sarbanes-Oxley uh, and other regulations that said, here is how you must act as, from a cybersecurity perspective. Here's what you must do. 
Um, and that, that tended to work for a while. Um, but then we quickly moved into to a risk-based area of cybersecurity, where you're doing things, successful organizations are doing things like not just looking at what, what are the things that are regulated and the data that's regulated that I need to protect or the systems that are regulated that I need to protect, but rather what are the risks from a business perspective that I need to guard against? Do I need to be more vigilant about protecting and, and watching for my R&D intellectual property going out the door? Because that's really what brings, gets me a competitive advantage as an organization. Uh, as opposed to you know the the personal information that I'm collecting. Now, obviously, there are still there is still a compliance uh, aspect to this. You still think still things like GDPR and the California regulation that that are regulating privacy and regulating how we're dealing with uh, individual data. And those won't stop. Those will just continue. But the successful organizations aren't stopping there. They're looking at at risk uh, and what are the non-regulated things that they need to care about. As we move forward, uh, we really see this as an era of, of ubiquity, where as you move forward into the fourth industrial revolution and you've got connected, not only connected devices, um, but connected people, right? We're moving into biometrics and um, <laughs> it seems far-fetched, but implants and the type of thing that will really mold or mesh the digital and phys physical world, that's where this becomes an issue, a very pervasive issue. This isn't just that we can protect our, our databases and protect our cloud repositories. We have to protect everything because everything is an entry point into those, into those areas. And so as we get there, organizations will have to look at cost efficiency. They'll have to go back to the, the point of risk and look at what are the risks that I need to uh, identify and, and judge and then protect against or respond to when inevitably there is uh, a breach that is successful or an attack that is successful. So there are three areas that I'd like to talk about quickly about uh, in terms of trends going forward that we see. Um, so the first one, uh, and Franny, you spoke about this a bit, uh, enterprise digitization and the Internet of Things. So uh, every organization is going through digital transformation. Uh, some are further ahead on the curve, some are further behind, but every organization to be able to be, stay competitive and stay relevant in the world today is going through some level of digitization. And that means that they're going through taking systems and processes that might have historically been manual or, or been uh, done in a way that, that didn't have certain threats to it, now have a very different set of threats, right? When you look at organizations sending, putting workloads and putting uh, files or, or, or different processes into the cloud, that does a lot of things around making actually some of the risks go away. Uh, it, it's generally those companies uh, are better at the basic blocking and tackling of cyber risk, of keeping the, the, the adversaries out, of identifying when they, when they do break in. But it also creates a, a different type of risk. It creates a risk around uh, the, your end users sharing that information and having it be easier to share. Uh, having your end users do things that, that configure the, the systems the wrong way, um, that expose data that in a new way that wasn't previously a, an issue. And then as you look at the Internet of Things and, and going to everything being connected, uh, again, it really creates just new new gateways and new doors into the environment and into your your information, uh, and takes a lot of the control that you might have had in the past out of your hands. And so, these are two things that that are really driving change within what what we're doing and what uh, what companies are doing to uh, address their risks. Uh, the next two things I'll talk about actually take it completely, uh, almost completely away from technology and focus on people. Uh, one of the biggest threats and biggest risks that any organization has is insider threat. And this doesn't necessarily mean that we're talking about the malicious user, uh, the, the user that's looking to exfiltrate data intentionally uh, to a competitor or to take to their next job or, or even uh, someone who's trying to sabotage a, a company on their way out. Um, but also the, the non-malicious user, the, the well-intentioned user. Um, in order to, to kind of 
get your arms around that problem. It's, you can't monitor everybody 100%. You need to be focused on, on the risks. And some of the things that, that we've seen companies be successful in doing this are looking at predictive indicators. And looking at predictive indicators in places that you might not usually look for them. So um, one area that's really interesting is looking at performance reviews. And you look at people who are performing lower, who have a downward trend, who might have one foot out the door already. And using that as an indicator to, to monitor different, those, that group differently. Um, similarly, if you're, if you're an organization going through restructuring or, or M&A activity, looking at the groups that might be most impacted uh, and therefore might be, might be disgruntled or might you know, be offered uh, a, a pathway out and, and monitoring them differently. Looking at access behavior, so our, uh, and, and data exfiltration patterns. So this, this to me is really about looking at baseline usage and defining and identifying anomalous behaviors. And so, you know, my, my personal traffic on the internet work-wise is pretty typical each day. I send a hundred, hundred, couple hundred emails maybe. Um, I don't spend a lot of the time uploading things into Dropbox or, or into my personal Google Drive. Um, but if one day a system can be tuned to see that that's my normal baseline and, and all of a sudden I'm uploading uh, a few gigs of data into a, a Google Drive, that's anomalous. That's something that, that should be looked at. You can expand that even out into uh, my group of, of people who do the same job as me, who are my peers. Are they doing things that, that look differently than those that do the same, same tasks on a daily basis? Um, you know, and then access behavior, so looking, taking some of the telemetry that you're able to get from, uh, from devices. So is this device something that we've seen before, that we've used before? Uh, is it something that is coming from a, a location that we expected to, or is it coming from, from a, a, a country where uh, we know this person shouldn't be? And, and taking all of those and, and being able to monitor that insider threat in a different way. Then that often drives uh, your ability to look at your, your people process and culture. And this is something that's often lost or, or missed in cybersecurity. We think a lot about the, securing the systems, defending that fortress or that village or that region, and not what are, what are, what's the, the people aspect and what, is the, what are the cultural kind of momentum within my company? Is it a company where uh, people are, are engaged and invested and, and uh, want to defend the brand and the company. Uh, and there's a lot of different ways that you can go about assessing that and asking that, those types of questions. And they really drive towards a workforce that is looking to do the right thing and looking to protect the, the company and, and not let others down. And the more that you can look at that from a cybersecurity perspective, um, the more you kind of reduce some of your, your insider threat and your residual risk around uh, data exfiltration, sabotage, et cetera. Um, and so with that, uh, I think I'm almost out of time. I'm happy to take a question or two if anyone has one, and if not, I'll pass it over to the panel. All right, thank you everyone for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Chris. Those are great remarks. And thank you, Franny, as well, for being here and, and your remarks as well. Um, you know, Chris said something interesting there that it's not just a technology issue when we're looking at cybersecurity. So I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to recognize the, the breadth of leaders that we have within this room today. So could we have any um, elected officials stand up and be recognized as well? There we go. Couple. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much for coming. You know, there is, there is obviously a lot of policy issues and other things beyond technology. And, and obviously for everyone here, from public servants to business leaders and all sorts of departments for coming today. Um, with that, we'd like to go ahead and jump into our panel discussion today. Um, we're excited to have a wonderful group of panelists here um, put together by Colorado Business Roundtable. So thank you to Jeff and Lisa as well for putting this wonderful group of professionals together. Um, let me do quick introductions here. First up, we have Sean McNeil, who is the threat management expert at Microsoft. Sean is the technology solutions professional specializing in threat management with Microsoft. 
He has been at Microsoft for two years and prior to that worked with consulting companies helping his clients implement Microsoft Cloud Services. Sean was also awarded as the Microsoft MVP for Office 365 for the five years prior to joining Microsoft. Help me join and welcome Sean. Next up is Doug Lacotte, I didn't La practice, LaHoga, totally off, <laughs> who's an executive Doug. cybersecurity, yeah. <laughs> who's an executive cybersecurity architect at IBM. Uh, Doug leads the IBM North American Security Architect Program. As a practicing architect, he leverages his expertise in cyber and cognitive security, IT governance, and enterprise architecture to help security leaders address industrialized threats, manage organizational risk, and enable strategic business initiatives. Over his career, he has worked with clients of all sizes across many industries, including retail, chemical and petroleum, travel and transportation, media and entertainment, healthcare, government, energy and utility, telecommunications, insurance, and financial services. No joke that there's a lot of them. And the welcome. partridge in a pear tree. Exactly, <laughs> yes. Welcome, Doug. And last but not least, we have Colin Connor here, who is the Director of Threat Intelligence and, uh, and Cyber Forensics at the AT&T Chief Security Office. Colin is responsible for threat intelligence and cyber forensic disciplines, protecting AT&T's infrastructure, AT&T services, and employees from cyber threats. His areas of focus include advancing threats and activities uh, re related to threat actors. Connor and his team utilize intelligence, cyber analysis, computer forensics, to prepare and respond to variety of cyber threats. The team also regularly contributes to a number of threats um, sharing organizations and AT&T's tech channel's weekly AT&T Threat Track security webcast. Welcome, Cal. <laughs> All right, enough of me talking. Let's listen to our experts now. Um, so to start, I'd like to go down the line and just have each of you kind of briefly dis discuss a recent cyber threat you've seen or a trend, of the, um, a, a type of threat, and how you and your organization handled it. Yep. John? So for me, uh, I work a lot in the healthcare uh, vertical uh, recently, and um, one of them is a, a, a company up in the Northwest that got hit by a phishing uh, attack. Um, the problem with this attack, or the, the, the issue it worked is, um, kind of talking with Chris is, they kept going at it. So um, it was used by email. Um, they had protections in place, but it only took one user. And that one user actually then ended up going and giving their credentials. Then what happened is it really mushroomed from there, because now the attacker had credentials to the organization, could log in as that user to their web-based email system, and now send out more phishing attacks internally, which bypassed a lot of their perimeter security they had in place, and so ended up the, uh, attacking other users and getting that going. So the issue that we had here is not that they were um, attacked or, or being breaches, that they weren't prepared to actually what to do once the attack happened and, and how to contain that and to uh, re remove that from their environment. So that was probably the biggest issue in, in really protecting the identities is what they, they've come to learn that they really need to do is s someone's going to get in. So identity protection is the key there for them. So I do a, a lot of work with critical infrastructure organizations like energy and utility companies. And I was talking with a CISO uh, of a large utility recently, and he's convinced he has dark nation state malware sitting inside his operational network inside the utility grid, waiting for, and this is his quote, not mine, the cyber cold war to heat up into a cyber hot war. And it's, it's a, a completely different level of threat than most organizations are prepared to handle these are utility companies. They're regulated. They don't have a lot of money to spend. They can't afford to hire, you know, the, the, the purple squirrels, as the recruiters call them, of, of security professionals. So uh, when you add that in with the fact that, you know, an organization like you described has the option of hitting the big red button on the data center wall, utility company can't do that. They have to learn how to run compromised. So one of the pivots that, that I've been talking a lot with, with CISOs about is both to gain attention within the organization, but also to change the approach from cybersecurity to cyber safety. How do you run compromised safely? And that culture of safety is one that the utility industry and, and other critical infrastructure understands. They understand how to go work on high tension power lines safely. So it's a pattern that we're trying to replicate into the cyber world. <clears throat> Thanks, Doug. 
Um, one of the things that um, I want to reiterate what um, Chris said and uh, Sean alluded to is that um, really, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you know, the firewall was our boundary, right? Parameter defense. That um, that is starting to shift um, pretty dramatically. And one of the things that um, we focus on, of course, mobility, mobilized voice, mobilized data, and now mobilizing video. That um, one of the things that we're seeing from a mobile standpoint is that um, even your uh, your apps, you know, your um, um, less reputable apps, they're using ad ad solutions that are actually um, selling underground proxy services through those apps, so that um, not only can um, and for actors get access to your internal network <clears throat> via um, phishing, et cetera, now your mobile devices on your network become a threat as well because that's a new access point into the network. Um, and it's not um, it's not just that, that also, you know, side loading apps, et cetera. That um, while you think that would be the major concern, that, um, like I said, we're definitely seeing some of these ad services that um, you see a lot of free games, right, on the, on the Apple Store, Google Play, et cetera, that then they have additional services. Some of those additional services are being sold for criminal purposes. But it's not always free. Yeah. <laughs> no, no such thing as a free public. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it sounds like it's dependent upon different industries, different devices, a lot of changes there. Um, and some of the other ones we mentioned right now, Internet of Things, fog computing, cri uh, crypto jacking. Technology is changing so fast, and obviously so does cybersecurity. What threat should organizations be most concerned about tomorrow, if you had the best guess? No difference. Uh, so, a little mic uh, changer. Uh, I, I think the, the IoT is the big one that we're seeing now. It basically is, we are, um, talking about how now we can have everything connected, but as Chris mentioned, now that there's no front door to your network or anywhere, there's no, perimeter. there's no perimeter, everything is an access point. The toaster in the break room now is there. There was one, um, I can't remember the specifics, but it was actually a vending machine that was internet enabled in, a, in an organization. They actually hacked through that, and because it was connected to the core network, it was hardwired in, if I believe correct actually then have access to it. So really it's the internet of thing is, 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 is we talked about it is you know it's bringing our life more more ease and making us more connected but uh, as the cyber security threat grows it just that many more endpoints have to protect and have to protect. So that's probably the big one is the internet of things. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, internet of things definitely used for us um, you know also being used for um, bot activity that um, not only beat off attacks that um, we have to defend against, but also um, credential theft, etc. And um, you, you mentioned um, crypto jacking, um, Andy. That um, we've seen definitely the ransomware shift um, you know, from a few years ago diminished really early April, and um, now it's really shifted to crypto jacking, the fog computing concept of now I can use everybody's computer to mine these crypto coins and um, ultimately um, um, had my wallet. So not only um, you know, just 100 machines, 1,000 machines, we're talking millions, billions of machines that um, can quickly um, you know, fund those with criminal software. Okay, so to date, most of the cyber attacks have either been attacking confidentiality or availability. So whether or not they're trying to steal information or deny us access to it. What we're seeing just at the beginning are integrity attacks. Uh, the Stuxnet malware that changed values and destroyed the centrifuges in Iran was an integrity attack. Uh, there's a, in the financial services industry, the nightmare scenario is a ransomware type of event, but what they do is they go change 10 records in your ledger, and they show you two of them to prove they did it for $20,000, they tell you what the other 18, but once you do that, how do you trust anything in there again? So what, building in that cyber resiliency for an organization where you may have had an incident months ago and now you've made six to 12 months of business decisions based on faulty data, that's the nightmare scenario for an integrity attack. 
And integrity attacks can come from a variety of different ways, like you guys mentioned earlier. So with these new sort of threats, that doesn't mean you can stop paying attention to the old sort of threats, right? From a malware, phishing, other attacks of that sort. So Colin, why don't you start us off and talk about how that's evolved over time? Yeah, great question. So we talked about digitalization earlier, that um, these criminal services are becoming commoditized. That um, now, you know, I mentioned ransomware, why it's decreased that um, it became so popular because that um, um, non-technical criminals could get in for really no money at all or, or minimum amount of, um, of, of upfront. Um, so it continues to evolve. You continue to have these criminal brokers that are providing the tools and capabilities for people that want to commit crimes. So we're seeing a lot of shift from the physical um, world to the digital world. And uh, I think that's definitely gonna continue. You know, we, we heard in the news recently, um, you know, Canadian um, um, crypto coin exchange was hacked and may not be able to pay the, the bitcoins, etc. So as more and more moves to digital, so will the criminal activity. Before I let you guys answer that question as well, can you just expand a little bit, or, or anyone on the panel, expand a little bit about crypto jacking and, and what cryptocurrency is these days? You know, I'm going off script a little bit here, but I think we have some business leaders here that aren't yeah. as familiar with it. No, great question. Yeah, so crypto, crypto jacking, you know, we've all heard crypto coins, right? So being able to install um, an application on your, your workstation, your server, that ultimately is mining those coins, doing some of the additional work um, that really needs the computation processes that need to um, generate those um, um, in the ledgers, the, the uh, um, um, transaction, transaction logs, et cetera. So you know, that it's a distributed technology. It's not at a specific bank, not at a specific location. So they're using resources across the internet. So they'll pay for those resources and um, give you, you know, a fraction of a Bitcoin, so to speak. And a fraction of a Bitcoin is not much for a single transaction, um, but you continue to do that billions of, of times uh, every minute, every second, over months. That um, you know, it's a lucrative business. Absolutely. And so what the what they're doing is they're using malware or a phishing attack to implant a crypto jacking code on your computer. So they're using your computer, your app, your electricity to mine these coins surreptitiously without your knowledge. Mm -hmm. So stay off the seedy side of the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I appreciate that definition. I think that helps with people. So um, Sean, why don't you continue on with the uh, malware and phishing and other threats? So I think phishing has evolved. It, it, we, we talk about, um, uh, Colin mentioned that it used to be, you know, I needed to have no funds or anything. Just I could just send out an email and just hope somebody clicked on it. That, that's what it, maybe less mm -hmm. than 1% clicked on it, they would still make money. So as we've started to educate users, and that's key to this, your users are on the front lines. I mean, they're, they're your first line of defense, is now we start educating them to not click on every single free this, free that, at, that you get more targeted spear phishing attacks now. Mm -hmm. They actually go out and mine now information from LinkedIn, from other social media to, to have a very targeted attack against one user or just a couple users. No longer is it just a blanket send it out to millions, I'm going to craft and spend time doing my research to really focus that on the one user to get them to click on that. So that's what I see. We, we see it's kind of the next evolution of phishing attack now is that very targeted, what we call spear phishing, is that they're, they're going for one user. And that is probably one of the hardest ones to protect because human nature, it, you're, you're really into the human nature aspect of this. It's, they know that I'm, maybe I, I posted on my Twitter feed that I'm going on vacation in, in a week. And so they'll use that in this target account. Hey, before you go on vacation, can you go do this for me? And I'm like, well, now I feel I need to because I'm going on vacation. So that human element is the hardest part to control there. And, and, and that's why I think it, it's going to evolve there and uh, short of turning off email. And I, I know Chris kind of maybe alluded, not, not saying that, but it's, it, it's some of the things where you almost got to just turn something totally off or, again, protect the identity. Let them click on something, but now you need multi-factor. That identity protection becomes the, the core of what's happening because uh, a lot of people think that, you know, I'm the low level, I'm a, just a, a grunt. Mm -hmm. Getting their identity can help that front door or that doorway into the organization. Now they start moving laterally. So there's no small person in an attack. If they get in the door, that they're in the door. Yeah, a great example of this that's just happened, and I'm sure there's people in the room that have gotten these. I have. They've taken... Um, passwords from a previous breach and they now send you an email claiming to have caught you in a compromising position and you can read on the internet what I mean by that um, 
And what they've done is they put your real password from one of these breaches at the top of the email. Mm -hmm. And so it's this, it adds credibility to the phishing attempt and they're actually being relatively successful with these. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's the old adage, don't believe everything you read. Mm -hmm. um, but if you see those in your organization, those are the types of things that are hard to defend against. Great. So how do you make sure that your organization stays ahead of these threats? You know, when you're looking at training and tools and white hack techniques, what are some specific detailed examples you can give? So I, in talking with organizations, large and small, brand names, you know, ones you've never heard of, I'm amazed at how much work we still have to do on basic hygiene. Making sure our systems are patched and current. Mm -hmm. uh, vendors like Microsoft have really improved that because, mm -hmm. you know what, we're going to just patch it for you now. Sorry, you don't have an option. Uh, doing that, getting away from the old forced password rotation every 90 days to better mm -hmm. passwords that last longer. Mm -hmm. Just that basic blocking and tackling still is the greatest challenge and the single best defense an organization can have. And one of the things that um, you guys alluded to is the human factor, right? You know, so our security awareness slogan is you are the firewall. Mm -hmm. That um, we understand that you are part of our security defense and we need you to be diligent and um, protect our environment as well. So, you know, security campaigns, um, integration with some of our authentication platforms of, of you know, constantly relaying information out there. As well as Andy alluded to, we have a monthly or a weekly um, um, program called Threat Track that's on YouTube that we publish and we'll say, you know, share some of the trends, et cetera, we're seeing. Um, because I think that um, this is, you know, we like to think of security as, you know, our single function, right? It's, it's really all of us need to band together and work together, um, not only within a company, but across company. You know, that's a great point. And I, I, I want to just emphasize that. I had a CISO for an airline tell me that in the last 18 months, it's been a dramatic shift and because the industries have realized that we don't compete on security, mm -hmm. that we really are all in this together. Mm -hmm. So even though IBM and Microsoft are competitors, we work together, AT&T and IBM, we all work mm -hmm. together on this and we need everybody in the industry to do the same thing. Share mm -hmm. the information, share the threats, share the attacks so mm -hmm. that we can all get better. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. It's that, that term frenemy type, type yes. situation where we're, we're, we're going after the consumer dollar, but we're also protecting everybody in there. So the, the last I would add to, to, you know, how do we, you know, stays ahead of threats, and it's something I want to build on what Chris mentioned is, is getting analytics and, and understanding what's going on out there. So um, UEBA, if you've heard this term, user and entity behavioral analysis. And what this really does is look at from, you know, what Chris said and even to take it further is, what do they do in a day in a day basis? Build up that profile. I'm not talking about me as a user. This is where we got to use that technology to help us for, for, uh, threat the, uh, uh, the cybersecurity threats. Is basically build up that. What does that user do in a day in and day out basis? What do they? Who do they interact with? And what do they do? And you build this up so now when that abnormal request comes, for me as a normal user, I start going to fiddle it, or my identity, let's put it this way, my identity starts going to fiddle around in the mm -hmm. payroll system or somewhere, accounts payable system, where I, I have no business being, I've never been there, mm -hmm. let's raise that red flag immediately so we mm -hmm. see that. So that UEBA type, mm -hmm. uh, Chris brought up great, what is the user doing? What is their normal behavior? And then you can alert on what's their abnormal. Mm -hmm. Are there specific tools out there that can Yes, uh, there's there several out there um, that, that can do this, that, that allow you to, uh, we have one, uh, shameless plug, but it, it takes from what the user is doing on premise as well as what they're doing in the cloud. Because again, we have to marry that of what they do in their day-to-day, -day, you know, on premise on their workstation in the file servers there, but also what are they doing in cloud services uh, in SaaS as well to, to help you correlate exactly that, that full range of uh, profile of the user. Mm -hmm. right. I'm actually going to use that and go off script again. So sorry to put you guys on the spot. But um, so how how do you guys, the technology experts, the threat experts and everything, get buy-in from business leaders and, and things in terms of the proactiveness that this will take? You know, right now cybersecurity seems so reactive. We hope we don't get a breach sort of thing. How do you can communicate the importance of the subject to other business leaders? Bring it up. <clears throat> so you mentioned proactive. We also like to look at the... Uh, predictive and preventative. I think we've alluded that to here. So my three P's, right? Predictive, um, 
preventative and proactive. So if we can say that, hey, we're going to, we see this trend across the internet, across companies, it's, it's coming our way, we need to prepare for that. That um, And when we block that, we need to evangelize ourselves, right? right? I think that's the challenge is that we're an infrastructure service at times and we're just expected to do our job and yes, we got we did what we need to do. But if we can evangelize those quick wins or near misses that, hey, this hit, um, we were able to mitigate this before it really became a business risk. And I think that's, um, you know, Chris alluded to it, risk, you know, risk communication that um, utilize the risk numbers that, um, you know, we were able to reduce um, our risk exposure. And so we have a cyber range that we bring organizations into and we put you under live fire for what a real situation would be, including a television studio where we'll put mm -hmm. your executives under fire from a reporter. But we see two kinds of organizations that come in. There's the ones that when, when the incident happens, they lean back and they respond on their heels. Mm -hmm. And then there's organizations that we bring in from the military, from three-letter agencies, first responders, who lean in when the scenario happens, and they start hunting for the threat on their toes. And that pivot from reactive security to proactive threat hunting is aspirational for most organizations, but it's where we want to get. The good news is, two years ago, we were battling for budget. Um, that's changed dramatically with some of the large breaches recently. Uh, no board of directors today is ignorant of the cyber threat. Uh, the challenge was when you get into an industry that's an agribusiness. They make wheat. You know what, What's the cyber threat to wheat? And, and having those kind of conversations, but when you, when you can bring it home to them, the light bulbs go off because every one of them was caught in one of the credit bureau breaches. Mm -hmm. So there's been a personal impact that right. people are aware of. Right. And I think that's key that um, this day and age that it's not when, it's if, uh, or, or when, um, not if, when uh, a cyber incident is going to occur. So that the more that you can prepare and plan for those things that um, you need to deal with, the better you're going to handle it. Yeah, there, w there's the joke in the industry, there's two kinds of organizations, those that have been breached. Okay, so there's one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I'd I just add on to that. I mean, it, I love the... The, the three P's you have, we work off of one we call uh, protect, detect, and respond. So the same kind of philosophy mm -hmm. is trying to protect as much as you can and, and talking to that and getting that board approval to, as Doug mentioned, is it's not if, it's when it's going to happen. So protect as much as you can, but be prepared to immediately respond and, and know, again, that the UEBA and the other thing to basically we, we talked about, and Chris mentioned this, in having the castle and the moat and everything, keeping the bad guys out. We also need those security cameras pointed inward to see when somebody does get past the moat it, over the over the, the castle walls what are they doing inside that's that detect and then being able to automate the response on that and having that life cycle there is key is um there's a lot of excellent and, and very good point products out there but the, the 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 issue is is getting them all to talk together um is based in being able to say when something happened at my perimeter correlate that with something else happening and and when you have two disparaged different systems with probably two separate admins and, and not integrated at all, you can't correlate that. So it takes you longer to determine we are being breached or that we're under attack at that time. So having that integration is, is very much key in this scenario. Yeah, it's a valuable second thing yes. to lose. So, so budget might not be a concern now, but staffing is. You know, when you look at uh, reports right now, I think it was a Forbes article that we had pulled that says it's, there's a shortage of 2 million cybersecurity professionals by 2019. I mean, that's next year. So this is a concerning issue right now. Um, how can we address this and how do we, what do you look for in an employee? So uh, this is one where it's a great time to be on LinkedIn as a security professional. We're hunted yeah. to extinction by recruiters. Um, I'm seeing organizations out there work with universities Mm -hmm. And they go in and they hire sophomores out of cybersecurity programs, and then they work two years as interns and are hired day one mm -hmm. to get out. Mid-size organizations, there's one CISO that I work with that admits that he's a farm team for the big boys, mm -hmm. that he's going to keep people for two or three years, and he can't pay them what the big guys can, and they're going to leave. Mm -hmm. And so he's structured his program around that. But when I go out to the question to hire someone, mm -hmm. I look for an aptitude for how they think. We can mm -hmm. teach people security. Mm -hmm. We can't teach them how to think about threats. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Bruce Schneier has a story that he, in the back of comic books when he was growing up, there was an ad where you could order ants through the mail. And the security guy says, cool, I can send somebody else ants through the mail. And that twisted mentality that we all have about looking for how things break, mm -hmm. that's what we look for. Yeah, I, I would add on to that is it's, it's great to have those credentials and all that, the alphabet soup behind your name, but th at the core, it's a, it's a problem solving exercise in, in really analyzing what's going on and how to best react to it. So those are the people we look for and, and I encourage companies when I go talk to them, what they're looking for. It's don't worry about the alphabet soup. As Doug said, we can yeah. train you and we can get that, get you up to speed on what you're doing. But if you understand, and it's more core to how things work. It's not just, if you under, you know, keep the bad guys out, that's fine. But if you don't understand how they could get and how DNS works, how, you know, email protocols work and how authentication protocols work, that's going to help them because they're going to say, uh, to Doug's point is, yeah. you know, they see something as, oh, it's a benefit. We're going to do this new service to our customers. They can see it as, uh oh, there's a big open door that we're opening up to the cyber criminal as well. So really that, that cognitive thinking and, and being able to react to and, and, and take things apart, deconstruct and be able to reconstruct them together is it's the more soft skills, I guess I want to talk about that you, you look for in your, in your staffing. Yeah. And, and one thing I want to add as well is attitude. That um, you know, security unfortunately can't be a profession. It needs to be your passion. That um, you know, that when I go home, it's not like the cyber criminal stop, right? So I need to be, um, you know, I need to be able to, to adjust as needed, and um, as well as keep up with things. That it's a hard profession. You know, we're constantly behind the game. When I think from an operation standpoint, we talk four nines, five nines. When we hit fifty percent on a security control, a security solution of effectiveness, we, we raise up our hands and say, hooray. Um, the industry's not there with the, the capabilities because that um, we're constantly, you know, uh, um, Franny alluded to, we're constantly being agile from an IT standpoint. So security is always lagging behind. So to keep up, we have to have the passion to say, okay, what if this happens? What if that, you know, what if, um, you know, what if, um, you know, um, how am I going to respond to that or how am I going to keep up with that? You know, we mentioned crypto jacking. How do I understand crypto coin, Bitcoin, how it works and how it can be abused, et cetera, right? Yeah, you know, one of the things that's different, I mean, technology is moving fast. Software development, all of those are moving yeah. fast. But the difference with cybercrime and, and cybersecurity is that we have an active adversary on the other side. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a hurricane or a natural disaster where yeah, this stuff happens and we kind of know what it is. We actually have someone working against us. And yeah. these people are very, very smart. They're very well funded and they're extremely patient. Mm -hmm. And so it really is a game of cat and mouse where they only have to get lucky once. Mm -hmm. And we have to succeed every single time. Mm -hmm. Well, that's depressing. Thanks. No. <laughs> <laughs> So come and join us in the cybersecurity world. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you seeing when, through your hiring, again, going off book a little bit, um, are you seeing the need for more entry level, more leaders, more managers? Uh, how is succession pipeline kind of working within your organization? So I got, I got pinged for a cloud security architect position with 10 years experience. Cloud hasn't been around that long. <laughs> or an entry-level SOC analyst with three years of experience. Yeah. We see that a lot. And yes. it, it, it's a real challenge because mm -hmm. people know that if you hire young, they're going to mm -hmm. come in and move on. And mm -hmm. corporate HR is not set up mm -hmm. with cybersecurity salary bans and cybersecurity raise structures. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's a real challenge for us. Mm -hmm. So what we see is a mix of people. Um, we have what we call our summit program where we work with college students and we bring them in mm -hmm. and then we grow them internally. Mm -hmm. We also do experienced hires and we also do very senior experienced hires. Yeah. But it's really that early career, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, mm -hmm. if someone's got two or three years of experience, yeah. they are not going to want for work. Right. And I think um, Sean alluded to, you need some of the background, right? You need to understand some of these technologies that you're defending because otherwise, what's this mean? Um, I don't know until I actually know that, um, oh, when I see this, this, and this, that's not expected. 
Uh, that's something much different than uh, I need to act differently. You know, so some of the things that we've done, um, you know, internships definitely, um, as well as I have a, a, a conversation this week with one of the local colleges around apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. The idea of starting to bring college kids in in their junior and senior year where they have some of that base um, experience that um, kind of a work study program to some extent that um, they can get some exposure um, into the day-to-day -day act cyber activities because that's the challenge is that you have your book knowledge and, and things but really you start to see things um, you know how they interact and how they're so meshed together that vulnerability management is not just separate but um, it also you know could you know lead to a breach or that um, you know as we see actors um, you know continue to weaponize certain vulnerabilities hey now we need to prioritize these so some of that, um, you know, like I said, um, predictive analysis and proactive and preventative all kind of mesh together um, in the cybersecurity world. You can't teach that, and you know, that from an entry level standpoint, it's a, a large uptick to kind of understand that. It's like being a, in a trade rather yeah. than yeah. in a profession. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's a great example. Is mm -hmm. working up through that, that you know, all the way through to do that. So it does take the the core knowledge, but. I say just the passion. I think Colin, you would do the security's got to be your passion. It just can't be your nine to five job, or because mm -hmm. you're you're not gonna, they're not going to survive in there. They're going to get bogged down. So mm -hmm. finding someone with passion to, to help and help people and help organizations is is going to be key to, to doing this. Again, the the core of what they're protecting or the, the how you know the attacker can be taught, but it, the, the core technology information is going to be key to that. Great. Cool. Um. Final question before we open it up for questions from the audience. Um, what are some of the external factors? You know, we mentioned some of this earlier. It's not a technology, it's a business sort of threat right now and risk. Mm -hmm. So so when you look at privacy laws like GDPR, public perception, law enforcement adjustments, they're all influencing cybersecurity in different ways. Can you just kind of give your impressions of that? Colin, why don't you start? Yeah, um, so um, I mean, cybersecurity you know, uh, I think it's been alluded to here a couple times, needs to be that competitive advantage, right? So we need to continue to move agile from an IT standpoint, but we need to be able to do it securely. That, um, that um, if we're focused on that, then some of these regulations, um, some of the law enforcement um, requirements, whatever, um, even, um, you know, GDPR, for example, right? External regulations that don't necessarily apply here that um, if we're constantly building security in our DNA, as we like to say at AT&T, that um, you know, we're going to be ahead of those and make small adjustments. If we're constantly waiting for that regulation to adjust us, then it's going to be huge jumps here, huge jumps there, or you know, we're just not going to meet those requirements and ultimately um, you know, suffer the consequences. I see a lot of organizations, if they have exposure to GDPR, which is the uh, general directive on Privacy, privacy regulation, yeah. something like that, or yeah. the damn privacy regulation, as one CISO <laughs> put it. Yeah. Um, they're just adopting that across the board, even for their own U.S. side, because it's easier. Uh, how many folks in the room know that Colorado passed a privacy law in June and it went into effect September 1st? Yeah, I get that a lot. Okay. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. We are we have a fragmented regulatory environment, mm -hmm. and if you look at building it in as a platform, uh -huh. then it's minor tweaks instead of a forklift effort. Uh -huh. So it's something, a little light reading for later. For the folks <laughs> in the room. I'm going to steal one that Colin, we had a pre-call to talk about this. I'm going to steal one that he didn't bring up, but um, I, I thought it was great when we mentioned this was, um, while it is still a technology issue, it's more a the, the way we do business. Um, we talked about shipping routers and hubs and stuff with default passwords that every single person in the world knows when they got one, it's the same password there. And then the, the, the problem with that normally is, is once you set it up, it doesn't require you to change it. So it's allowed to stay with those defaults. So mm -hmm. that is just one of the key things. It, it, it is a technology issue, but it's more of just a decision making or, or you know, cost of business, I think it is to, yeah. it's so much easier to, to put a default firmware on something and not have to customize and ship it out the door mm -hmm. than taking the time to really be secure at the beginning. Uh, yeah, it, it's yeah. something I, I, we, we talk about, and you know we, we've talked about a lot of things. GDPR. I, I, I agree with both the, the two mm -hmm. gentlemen here. Is when when we talked about GDPR uh, at Microsoft, the companies where maybe they are just U.S. based. Is it's not if it's going to come to the U.S. Mm -hmm. It's when. So take this opportunity 
to make yourself aware of it and, and, and build your practice around that today because it, it's coming and it's not something, why not get ahead of the curve as Colin mentioned versus being forced along? Why don't you make the, the actual jump and, and do that proactively? It's mm -hmm. to Chris's comment in the keynote. We're moving, we went from compliance to risk and now we're going to an era of pervasive security. Mm -hmm. It's gotta be baked in at the beginning. Yeah. Design not just your IT for it, but mm -hmm. design your business to be secure. Cool. Well, with that, we're out of time for this portion, so we'll open up for questions. But let, let's thank our panelists for their comments so far. I just you want to grab a mic. We're going to borrow a mic from you guys. Can we take that if you guys don't mind sharing. Um, and then, what questions do we have from you? Randy, wants to start? I have 700, so. That's what. I love the conversation about where do you find the talent, how do you look at it. Um, one of the things that I see in, in cybersecurity, in uh, you know, big data jobs, that we put highly skilled people here and say, okay, we want you to do this. And because they haven't done, put together an organization to really in a very strategic way, these people wind up doing jobs that are repetitive and then they quit because they can't afford to do so because their skills won't stay up. So when you go in and consult, what kind of advice do you give executives on that framework for building the team? Not just where do you find them, and, but what, what's the framework that they need to look at? So one of the things that we do is we say automate. Automate all you can. Um, we obviously we sell those kind of solutions so there's good reasons to do it and we it's all about ROI and cost benefit and quicker response one of the CISOs I work with said that's all great I want it for staff retention so that my senior guys don't have to go spend you know two hours remediating the 437 times somebody clicked on a flash video of lying monkeys and they get tired of it so he has a rule that every time they remediate an incident they must automate it. And it's hands off. Now, I'm not a big fan of that because you can weaponize the automation against them, but it's, it's a low touch automation. So the grunt level stuff, the computers do. And then we move up the threat chain to the really sophisticated stuff and let our smart people do that. Right. Those things that you see again and again and again, and here's the 10 steps that I follow. Let's automate that really, you know, the tier one, so to speak. Let's let's remove that tier one so the things that we're dealing with actually require human interaction. Yeah, I, I just added that too. Uh, the more I, you know, back from my admin days too, if I did something more than twice, that's when I would start automating it. So to your point, is once I do it two or three times, let me spend the extra maybe 15, 20, if it's short hour shell script work in, in my end, but it's going to make my job so much easier to your point, friend, is I'm not doing that repetitive thing over and over again. You know, definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. So, yeah. definitely. And, and one thing that you alluded to is that cybersecurity requires creativity and innovation. That um, the way that I foster my team on that is that we have things that we need to get done every day. Let's get those rocks, so to speak, done in the morning so that your afternoon is unstructured. So if you want to go do a threat hunt and look for this or you want to go research that, you have that flexibility, or you find something in the morning, you want to dig in more, you have that time to respond um, so that you're not constantly, you know, um, putting out fires, right? So you're dealing with those things you need to do with, deal with first thing, you know, from the compliance, regulatory, you know, breach response, et cetera. And then let's start doing those things that um, we can continue to grow. Maybe even some of the automation that, hey, I saw this, and I think let me go work on this a couple hours a day. And, um, because that's, um, if we're doing the same thing as Sean mentioned again and again and again, that um, it's going to install the creativity and innovation. And that's really where we succeed in security when we do that. Okay. Other questions? Dan, I see your hand up. Thank you. Um, I first want to thank the panel, sponsors, and speakers for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Stan, I'm here from CSU Global. Uh, I wanted to follow up a little bit more about how we were talking about the, the shortage of workers in cybersecurity, and how we're just going to need more and more experts in the field. I was wondering if you might be able to speak a little bit about how, uh, what efforts are your companies taking to 
uh, create that interest in that passion in underserved populations or women or uh, people who haven't had a lot of um, historical participation in the cybersecurity field. You know, are there efforts to bring in uh, more diversity into the cybersecurity field? And if so, you know, how uh, do your organizations contribute to bringing in that new type of workforce? So um, much like Don, uh, Doug mentioned, at Microsoft we have very much what we call our mock program. So you're doing internships and then hiring right out of college. But I think it actually starts a lot sooner. Uh, at, the, at the STEM level, at the elementaries, in junior highs and high school. Um, I'm fortunate at Microsoft, we actually do support, we, we do a, with Denver Public Schools, I actually do a, a, a career coach mentoring program. So we go into high schools, I work with uh, Abraham Lincoln High School, and go in there and talk about the technology opportunities to those students. And if you're familiar with Abraham Lincoln, it's in a little lower poverty area, but we're making sure that they understand don't keep you know, money or your parents' income or anything as a barrier. There's programs out there to get you into schools to allow you to, to, to do that. So building that passion, I think, as early as we can. I have a daughter who's 12, so I love that she's getting into math and liking science. So I am trying just to foster that, just as a parent. is that, But that STEM, I think, really needs to start back in that elementary, middle school time to help them be, to understand they can do it, not that it's something that you know you got to have the brains to do it you can build that muscle and, and work on that. So that, that, I guess, would be my answer there. Yeah, and, and you know, AT&T, we have a, women of AT&T, they recently sponsored a STEM event both here at um, the Denver Tech Center as well as down at Colorado Springs. So we had coding in there. We, uh, one of my um, staff, um, she spoke on cybersecurity. So continue to help others understand the possibilities of security. It's not just, you know, this, this rigid job. It's something much more, um, um, comprehensive and much more pervasive, as well as that, um, you know, continuing to, um, you know, make diversity a priority. That um, I know all companies have um, the requirements of, you know, you have to go to this training, go to this. And, you know, not only that, you know, at and you know, we actually had to go to a, a full day seminar to talk about diversity. Because that, um, you know, like I said, creativity, innovation. How are we going to get that? We're only going to get that through different perspectives and you know, igniting these passions in, um, in our next generation. One of the other things, uh, I currently work for Kathy Frame. Um, she's the director of, of security in North America for IBM. She's one of the best people I've ever worked with. She's ironically speaking as the keynote speaker for a women's cybersecurity event in the next couple of days. And one of the things that I watch how she brings in new people uh, particularly young women, is it's networking. She is open to taking those conversations and networking, and I help broker conversations. When I meet somebody at an event like this, I connect them because for all that we need a lot of people, it's also a little bit of a click in a club, and you've got to get in. And so one of the things I love about these interactions is making those connections between companies with people to find mentors to help them with their careers. Question in the back there. Okay, the first. I have a couple of questions for you. I own a small business. I'm I'm curious what percent of cyber attacks are just pure vandalism and what percent have a profit motive. Um, secondly, I don't have the scale in a small business to have cybersecurity experts and so on. So. I went to a seminar a couple of years ago put on by a chamber with the Secret Service and they created this, you know, doomsday scenario and I went up to them and said, so what do we do? They said, go find somebody. So what advice would you have to a small business? And thirdly, how do you feel about purchasing cyber insurance? Um, so three questions. So the cyber insurance, maybe. Um, that industry is having a real problem with calculating risk because it's risk is based on probability, and probability is the one thing we can't find. Because of those active adversaries, security is black, a black swan event. You just never know when it'll happen. I, my family is a small business as well. I outsource it. I put as much stuff as I can into, into the cloud. We use Office 365, because Microsoft can afford a $100,000 firewall versus my $15 one. Uh, that's, the cloud is your friend when it comes to this for small businesses. And the first 
piece was Vandals. Vandals. Um, criminals, nation states, activists or hacktivists. There is vandalism out there, but the big one that I see is cybercrime. Chris, Colin, that's probably more in your area. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, so ironically, we'll see um, DDoS attacks, for example, increase as, as, as colleges either are on vacation or get out for the summer. So there's some of that, but most of it is very criminal focused, or at least, you know, we think of criminals trying to steal my credit cards. You know, you may be you know, providing services to another company, and you just may be an entry point to the other company that they've got they've got your access, and now they're selling it on the underground for somebody that wants access to this other company. So, I mean, it's it's you know a lot of a lot of criminal focus, a lot of monetary. It's like I said, the, the physical is starting to move to digital because that um, it's harder, it's easier to hide, and it's becoming so commoditized. Yeah, and I'll just build a little bit on to your question about how do you do it as a small business. I mean, I, I appreciate Doug there kind of, you know, uh, giving uh, Microsoft a shout out, but it, that is what we build on. Um, and it is for that integrated solution, so that integrated collaboration solution, but we also then are able to secure that. And so we know all, all, all how our work, so we, what we call is we build in the security, we don't bolt it on. And so for a company like your size and a small company, it, it makes it easier, it, as I talked about, that integration and that collaboration of your tool sets. If you go with one single vendor, obviously I'd love it to go with us, but we know everything that's going on. And again, we, we talked about the cloud. I think that was a perfect, cloud is your friend. Because back in the early days of the cloud, you know, seven, eight, nine years ago, we talked about, we had to convince people to go put their data in the cloud because they couldn't go into their data center, couldn't go touch the server and touch their data. Now with the scale of the cloud, as, as Doug mentioned, is the, the synergy that we can bring to knowing what's going on for everybody and, and, and taking that data and, and exponentially realizing where the new, next threats are coming from, able to block those much more quickly than any single organization can do. Yeah. And for, do you have like a list of best practices for small business systems to offering these events? Yes, yeah, yeah. So we could uh, maybe talk, talk offline here and yeah. get with me there. And as well that, um, you know, risk appetite, you know, that, um, you know, how um, risk adverse are you in certain areas? You know, what are your concerns? That cyber insurance may be something that you need because you um, see that um, there's a potential that, you know, my credit cards could be stolen or whatever the case may be, and um, I could be potentially sued. You know, as, as do I have a concern on that or am I willing to um, walk, um, a little more risky, risk adverse there, and um, invest some of my other my money in other methods that ultimately protect me. Um, as well, you know, there's there's you know different entities that have used say um, the um, critical um, internet control SIS20, um, as well as um, NIST cybersecurity framework um, to build a, a roadmap, so to speak, of okay, I'm going to tackle this, I'm going to tackle that. Um, the New South Wales government. Um, um, comes to mind. Um, they've just recently published their whole initiative and they're, you know, here's the business risk that we're trying to address and here's the mechanisms we're doing it. And we're going to do it in phases. We're going to, you know, tackle the 80% here and then worry about the additional 10, 20% in additional phases, etc. Question right there. I'm going to zoom out here and the mic. Um, oh. <laughs> Hi there. This is more for, I think, this would be AT and T, Colin, and um, I'm just curious about the 5G networks, right? The, the new networks that are coming out, and really the uh, the build that the nation is really—it's like a race to market for the 5G networking. Um, is that going to be more secure than the current technologies? So that's the challenge: is that um, as we add in more technology, you know, we're building in more security DNA, um, making it more secure. Definitely, it's going to be stronger than 2G, 3G, 4G. Then again. You know, as um, you know, attacks are becoming more sophisticated, things will come up that we have to continue to adapt. So yes, we, we understand some of the limitations. We have mechanisms that we deal with some of the, the sniffing, the snooping, um, uh, masquerading, um, et cetera, um, already. That some of that building being built into um, the new solutions. I mean, it's the evolution. Um, so bottom line, yes. Yeah. So also as a, as a business owner, I understand 
or let me put it this way, I feel pretty comfortable that when I buy a PC from one of my employees, I can dictate what they are or are not doing during the workday on that PC. Um, my question is, when the employee brings their own device, when they bring their own mobile, they're, they're not, I'm an Android person, they're an Apple person, so they bring it in. Um, to some extent, I can secure that device, but at the same time, it's their own personal device. They're going to use it outside of business hours for personal things. So p policies, procedures, stances on bring your own device and what, do, what can companies do or require of their employees who maybe have purchased their own devices and are using them for personal reasons? So, I actually help IBM build that program. Um, at one point, we had 25,000 BYOD Max at, at the company. And we, it was a very simple policy uh, that we have and we still have today. If you use it for business purposes, we are going to secure it the same way we would a corporate device. All the same policies. We have the right to seize it if there's an incident. It's uh, one of our, uh, our guys' jokes. It's a surrender your own device policy. <laughs> I see a wide variety of organizations struggling with this. Uh, policy, either allow it or don't, explicitly. Make a decision. Make a different decision for laptops and mobile devices. And then whatever your decision is, you're going to have to have some level of technical controls in place to enforce it. So if you're not going to allow them, well, don't put your email on the internet. You know, require that it, it has a certificate on the device so that you can control whether or not they can do it. Um, I had one executive who had his credentials stolen. They didn't fish him, they fished his kids. And they got the malware on his home PC and then captured his VPN credit. So it is a huge threat vector, but you, you need to take a step back and, as Collins pointed out, have that risk conversation. How much risk do you want to accept? Right. Um, as well, that, um, you know, as we talked about cloud, right? That, um, you know, don't put all of your security, don't, you know, you don't have to worry, you don't have to put all your security on the endpoint device. Also put security or, you know, put some secure deployment on the data itself or the, the, the products, you know, whatever you're trying to protect. That, um, because that, um, you know, they're not, you know, the criminals, uh, adversaries, et cetera, are not trying to gain access to the PC. They're ultimately trying to gain access to something you have, whether it's, you know, your access to credit cards, your access to certain data or other companies. That, um, so, you know, virtual desktop environment is a great example. Mm -hmm. That, um, so you may bring your PC that um, I'm going to put some controls there, but um, you're going to now connect into a virtual environment that I'm going to put my real controls. Um, so kind of a layered approach from that standpoint. I'm going to cut out some of the risk here, but your PC is not going to have direct interaction with that data, so to speak. Yeah, and I'd add on what, build on what both of the gentlemen said is, you have mobile device management. So that's you know, locking down the device itself, but then what we feel that they have a lot is mobile application management. So now I take that you're gonna that, that email application, it can be on any device. It doesn't have to be a corporate owned device, but I'm gonna control how that data is accessed by that profile on there. So they can't cut and copy paste it to another unmanaged application on that same device. And to your point, we, we see this a lot in the personal spaces. I've got a lot of games on my phone that if if I left the company, I don't want them to wipe and factory reset my personal device. I want them to basically just take the corporate data and remove it. So selective wipe is what really we work with there. So that's some of the things we're doing there to, to change the way you're doing that, not just blanketly wipe it, but selective wipe of just corporate data off of, off of a device. You can go right over there and then we'll come up to you. Hi, my name's Wynne Shaw. I am um, from the city of Lone Tree and we just converted to Office 365. My question is, though, with a government, a lot of uh, threat uh, comes from physical presence. What if our connection to the internet is, is interrupted? What is the right balance of local servers versus cloud? So I have one company that I just met with in New York. Um, several hundred million dollars, have, their entire on-prem infrastructure consists of a Wi-Fi hotspot. And everything is in the cloud. And what they've done is two things. Uh, there's dual redundant cables going out 
both sides of the building, one to at t one to one of their competitors. Um, cellular backups is another option. And worst case for this organization, Starbucks. Um, that's that risk conversation again uh, between what you want remote, what you want local. We're seeing an inexorable move to the cloud. Companies and organizations and industries that I never thought would go to the cloud are running there. Uh, the Department of Defense has a $10 billion contract out for cloud services. Uh, the CIA just signed a big contract for cloud services. So the cloud is not, as long as you have proper contractual protections in place, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud, most often the cloud can be more secure. Because like for the city of Lone Tree, I used to live there, thank you very much, um, you don't have a large budget. And your cloud providers, a sales force or a work day, have much greater resources because, again, we're all in this together. They're split sharing those across all of their customers. Yeah, and then I just go back to that, again, the identity is the key. So how you get to the cloud is, again, you're securing that identity. So we're seeing a lot more now, and the push now is, is passwords are bad. And so I know this is incorrect in your question, but we are trying to go to passwordless um, logon. So multi-factor authentication, other methods, biometrics and stuff, because, again, the, the hackers and stuff, they have the password. They don't have your fingerprint. They don't have your facial recognition. So really going passwordless is, I think, the next evolution that we're really pushing for around the, the security landscape. Right. And, you know, from business operations that, um, as, as um, <clears throat> Doug alluded to, you know, can I go to Starbucks to do what I need to do, you know, from a business continuity? that, um, I mean, you have to have some of those business operation conversations, discussions of, you know, how timely is this? You know, some, you know, EMS, emergency management services, right? You may not be able to do that. So I'm gonna have to build some contingency plans there. Um, but that's where risk analysis comes in. Let me look at the risk that I'm dealing with, how much money do I wanna spend in each of those? Last question, Dean. Hi, Dean Stanbury. Um, I work in commercial real estate and facilities management, which is an industry being inundated by IoT. Um, you know, and and some of the cybersecurity issues around that. Um, one of the things, uh, for example, today there are sensors that they can deploy in this room that can read everybody's heart rate and breathing patterns in this room and determine if in an individual is subject to a you know a heart attack coming up. Um, but when you think about what those sensors can do and you think about some of the predictive analytics, behavioral analytics that you're alluding to, um, there seems to be this, this element for abuse. Uh, so talk a little bit about the ethics of IoT and the ethics of, um, of the kind of analysis that you can do um, and if it falls into the wrong hands or wrong employer. Mm. It's a great question. That um, some of the behavioral analysis, right? That um, if I gain access to some of that internal data, that um, can I use that potentially um, um, for blackmail, um, for potentially targeting, or that um, um, uh, now am I starting to single people out because they're going to say, you know, Chinese websites because they have an interest for their, you know, for their maybe for their heritage or a spouse or whatever the case may be. That um, it's it's a it's a strong um, it's a challenge, no doubt. Um, that um, and that's where I mean we need to look at some of the trends, etc., and, and normalize that and tokenize it so that you're not saying, oh, I know Fred, and then um, why is he going to this? He must be. So I mean, it's it's yes, ethics. You know, um, I you know I had a biology and computer science degree. You know, so bioethics was definitely the rage um, from a genetics focus. Um, now it's becoming more and more um, from a cybersecurity standpoint of how are we utilizing that data. And you know, that's really where some of the GDPR stands um, goes to, right? Is that um, I'm collecting this data and um, now I need to let others know that I'm collecting it and be able to be open with how I'm utilizing that. And it, Colin just brought up the lat that I was gonna bring up. And we, you know, if you remember around probably May time frame when probably a lot of your applications, everybody changed their terms of services and you got all these alerts and these emails that have updated. Well, that all was around GDPR. 
So are we going to, your, to your point now, if this room has those sensors in there, am I going to have to uh, sign and in, in, uh, acknowledge that these sensors are in this room? So I take it from a different way. What, what does the company do to protect it? You know, obviously that's cybersecurity, but are, are we going to start requiring now when I walk into a, a room equipped like that to acknowledge it, you are, to, to Colin's point, is collecting that data. At least let me know you're collecting it. And so it gives me the choice to turn around and walk right out the room or something like get yeah, opt yeah. out. So, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's tricky, you know, slippery slope how we're going to deal with this information. I don't have a right answer for you, unfortunately, but it's, it, it's, it's stuff to think about. Yeah, so the Internet of Threats meets the uh, data industrial complex, uh, as Tim Cook puts it. And this is where machine learning and AI and the correlation and the de-anonymization of data is coming in. And that's where technologies like differential privacy, which is what Apple uses, so they can gather the data but not get it down. Um, there, I came out of the marketing world. And you notice I don't work in the marketing world anymore. I, the, the creepy nature of, of this is challenging. The IoT space in particular is one, and I think ultimately, and this is not an IBM opinion, let me be explicit, I think ultimately we're going to have to have some form of government regulation, uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission, just like you can't make flammable children's pajamas, you can't make insecure IoT devices and sell them in the United States. That's ultimately where we're going to have to get to, because the mar this is one of those rare occasions where the market is not working. Uh, what, a, what a great discussion. Thank you guys for coming. Give it one more hand for Sean, Doug, and Colin. Thank you guys very much. Um, and, and with that, we're going to start wrapping up. I know we're getting close to the 9 o'clock time. Uh, before I turn it over to our provost, Dr. Karen Ferguson, for some final remarks, I just want to thank one more time everyone for coming. I want to thank Cobert, Jeff, and Lisa for their help putting together this wonderful panel. Thank you guys. Thanks to everyone from CSU Global, Global who put it on and History Colorado Center and Denver uh, Business Journal for their support of this event as well. And now for some closing remarks, Dr. Karen Ferguson. Sorry, I did choose the side of the stage that has the stairs. Um, so again, I appreciate all of you coming out today and the time and attention that you gave this very important topic. We really are all walking around open data sets. Um, we expose ourselves, we expose our businesses and everything that we do on the internet. And it is so important as we work ethically in our businesses to make sure that we're securing our data, our own personal data in our effort to secure the data related to our businesses, our customers, our clients, and our students. And I appreciate your willingness to come out this morning and take part in this really important conversation. It's engagements and events and, and being related to industry like this that allows CSU Global to continue to offer the career relevant and industry aligned programs that we offer. And it really is an honor to have experts um, like the four that we had here today talk to us about such important, relevant, and ever-changing topics. These are topics that I'm sure by the time you guys leave today, something you will have said is outdated. Mm -hmm. Right? So <laughs> we all have an obligation to stay in tune with that. Um, and I, again, I appreciate your willingness to do that. At Global, we're committed to providing access to low-cost, high-quality education each of you should have received a packet when you walked in. There's some information on some of the programs that we have related to the topics that we talked about today. Um, the one thing I want to draw your attention to is our focus on our approach to lifelong learning. So whether it's a certificate, a specialization, a degree program, we offer these in ways that are both flexible and stackable. So our students can come in and retool as they go on in their career and know that what they're working on counts today. It will also count tomorrow when they come back for more education. So if you have any questions about any of our offerings, we have uh, people here who are willing to talk to you about that. Um, and otherwise, please stick around, grab yogurt, have some time, meet with colleagues, um, and please connect with each other as you go off about your day. And lastly, again, thank you, Jeff. So glad you made it here safely. Franny um, and all of our panels and Chris, our keynote. Thank you again. Have a great day. <laughs>